started, I'll just make some general remarks. Of course, we all know you very well, but um, wanted to remind all of us that you were first elected to the House of Representatives in 2006, and uh, his assignments have been the Committee on Energy and Commerce, uh, serving on the subcommittees of Commerce, Manufacturing and Trade, and the Subcommittee on Energy and Power. Uh, Congressman Sarbanes has worked on a wide variety of issues in Congress, including health care reform, student loan reform and the ongoing effort to protect the Chesapeake Bay. For many years, the 3rd Congressional District included Anne Arundel County, Baltimore City, Baltimore County, and Howard County, but now it includes parts of Montgomery County, uh, parts that I used to represent. So I'm very happy that you are there leading uh, the charge. And, um, and of course, I know that my colleagues will have uh, different you know questions and issues that they care about. Um, obviously, on our minds, we continue to have transportation funding uh, at the federal level and the needs that we have here, that's a major priority for us. Also, we would like to know about the impact on sequestration, budget negotiations. I'm very interested, of course, in immigration reform, as we have heard some very positive announcements. Um, today, particularly, President Obama giving a speech in Las Vegas regarding this, and of course, health care reform, um, and also the expected impact on local governments, which I know it's been an issue that you are, are very well versed in, and have led the way. Uh, so welcome, and I'll just open it um, Thank you. for you, and uh, this is very casual, and uh, yeah. we're a pretty friendly bunch, so we do have two council members that couldn't join us, um, Valerie Carl Irvin, oh, okay, Valerie Irvin and Council Member Reamer uh, not able to join us, but Nancy yes, joined us. Great. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to come and talk with the council, and I um, want to congratulate you on your recent uh, assumption of the presidency, okay. and Craig on the vice presidency here of the, of the council. I'm... I'm very excited to be um, now representing a part of Montgomery County, and I worked hard during the campaign season to make sure I was getting around and getting to meet people in that new part of the district. Um, and now, as of January 3rd, when I was uh, sworn in, I'm officially representing um, an area that includes um, Brookville, Olney, Burtonsville, Sandy Spring, and then sort of comes down that 29 uh, New Hampshire corridor as far as the White Oak area. And I actually, I brought some materials because I'm the new kid on the block, so I wanted to give you some information. Um, but there's actually included in here um, a map which shows in, in blue the part of Montgomery County that is included within the 3rd District. So that gives you, um, that gives you a sense of it. Um, the good news is that as a commuter, I'm one of the few members of Congress who um, has the ability to actually get back home every night, and Phil and I were just talking about that. It's a blessing, I, I uh, find, because you get out of the bubble, you get back and talk to real people and real constituents, and you get that kind of daily gut check on what's happening in your district. But about 80% of my district, as weirdly shaped as it is, and I know some people here are aware of that, um, <laughs> about 80% about of the district can be accessed within about 15 or 20 minutes of that commute that I take every single day. And certainly the Montgomery County portion of the district falls into that category. So um, I expect to be very present in the new uh, part of the third district, which is in Montgomery County. And already um, getting to know some of these communities has been a, a wonderful uh, opportunity. And I look forward to, uh, to building on that. I've included um, as well some information on the left side here of the kind of outreach we're hoping to do. Mm -hmm. So there's a list of the, my current offices, which include Towson, Annapolis, Washington, of course, but we're adding an office in Burtonsville. <coughs> we'll be having an opening soon. We have the address, but it's not quite open yet, so we'll certainly let people know when that, when that happens, and that'll be, a, uh, I think, a good resource for people uh, in the county. <coughs> in addition to that, we're going to have um, regular monthly outreach hours beginning in March of this year um, at the White Oak Senior Center, Longwood Community Rec Center, East County Community Rec Center, and at Maryland Praisner Community um, Rec Center. And those, those uh, locations offer pretty good coverage of the part of Montgomery County that, um, that I represent. Um, so that, that's kind of a word on the constituent service side of things. And, and I put a high, high premium on constituent service and, uh, you know, the timeliness of our response to concerns that, that people bring to us um, regarding any matter that, 
that has a federal component to it. So if a constituent needs help with Social Security or uh, Medicare or there's a visa issue or something like that that involves um, a veterans issue that involves a federal agency, that's our job. And I, I will expect that there will be um, opportunities for us to refer from our office inquiries com that come in that are um, better handled um, by the county council um, and vice versa. And um, the major overlap of my district is with um, Valerie Irvin's district, but there's also a portion mm -hmm. that uh, overlaps with your district, uh, Nancy. So um, I expect that we'll We'll develop that relationship that we can really work together to help the constituents that we um, that we jointly uh, jointly represent. Um, I thought I would I would just step back and offer two um, perspectives in terms of um, Washington and that part of the job. Um, one is kind of the general state of affairs there now, and um, as you know, we we haven't finished navigating the <coughs> fiscal issues that confront us. We, we did um, substantially address some of them in that fiscal cliff deal that was reached right at the end of the year, but there were still some things that were punted. And there's various deadlines that loom. Um, the House voted the other day to push off by uh, three months the debt ceiling um, situation, but it'll be back. Um, at the same time, we're going to have to get a budget through um, or risk the potential of a, of a government shutdown. And then we've got these sequestration cuts, which, again, the fiscal cliff deal delayed that for two months, but that's sort of back on the horizon uh, soon. And you well know the, the implications of that for, for places like Montgomery County. There's a, you know, the way it stands now, you, you'd be instituting an 8% across the board cut. The problem with, with that approach, with the sequestration approach, is it's, it's done in kind of a sort of wholesale arbitrary way. It's not a thoughtful process of, of making cuts and finding savings, which everyone recognizes has to be done. The President, of course, is pushing, and I and other Democrats in Congress certainly support his view that um, dealing with the sequestration issue ought to be done in a, continue to be done in a balanced way so that we're not looking to cuts exclusively to solve the problem, but there's also a revenue proposals on the table, and that's going to be a contentious discussion as we move uh, forward. But particularly jurisdictions that are heavily dependent upon uh, the federal government, um, either directly or indirectly in Montgomery County would be in that uh, category, uh, um, are anxious, rightly anxious, about this sequestration issue. Um, it has even potential implications for, you know, the bond ratings. You have a terrific <laughs> bond rating in Montgomery County, but, um, you know, as sequestration and these other fiscal impacts loom, um, you know, counties like Montgomery County may get looked at through a different lens. Um, so uh, so that's, that's kind of what's happening on the fiscal side. In terms of other substantive matters that we're, we'll get attention, um, gun control is, is clearly uh, on the agenda. It will not be easy to get these measures in place. Uh, hard to believe that the resistance to things that I view, and I would expect many of you here view as common sense proposals um, uh, is out there, but there is significant resistance. I think we'll have, we'll have uh, substantial progress on sort of universal background checks as a threshold matter. Um, but as you know, one of the problems is that there are, particularly in the Senate, there are a lot of rural states. Um, where there's a heavy influence from the other perspective on this, and that may affect our ability to get uh, some of the things that, that the President and the Vice President has put forward um, through the Congress. I, I certainly am a very strong supporter of gun control, um, always have been, and I think all of the measures that the Vice President uh, unveiled recently at the press conference are ones that deserve serious 
serious consideration and I'd like to see passed ultimately. Um, I want to note that the resistance to it, the organized resistance to it, doesn't just come from organizations like um, the NRA, which gets a lot of attention, but there's a lot of um, moneyed interests uh, behind it. The gun manufacturers have a pretty strong uh, lobby as well in uh, Washington. I'll come back to that theme of money and politics because it's something I'm particularly uh, focused on. Uh, but there are some, there's some information that suggests that uh, some of these manufacturers build their sales models on an assumption that at least 20 percent of the, um, the weapons will, will get sold illegally. Hmm. So the industry is even building on the assumption that that is happening out there. And um, there's many reasons why this is the time to respond. Comprehensive immigration reform, of course, um, was put front and center yesterday by this group of eight senators, four Republicans and four Democrats, who put forward a set of principles. Uh, the President is speaking today. Um, I think that his proposal, from what I understand, um, will be um, a little bit more uh, generous in terms of, of the path that one needs to take to citizenship um, than what was suggested yesterday and that ultimately there'll be some kind of compromise um, in the middle there. But clearly the conversation is happening in a meaningful way. And, and Senator Menendez, I think, put it very well in, in describing why it's happening the way it is now. He said that uh, Americans support this, uh, according to all surveys. Um, the Hispanic community in particular expects it, the Democratic Party wants it, and the Republican Party needs it. And so you have all of the ingredients that suggest we might actually be able to get comprehensive immigration reform done um, in a serious way in this term. Um, in terms of my own interests, I won't go through everything, but I did put a card in the right-hand side here, which is um, sort of an overview of what my committee assignments have been since I came to Congress uh, in the 110th Congress. Um, my primary committee assignment now is Energy and Commerce which is a terrific committee. Uh, Henry Waxman is the uh, ranking member there. Um, and um, Congressman Upton is the, is the current uh, Republican chair of the committee. It has broad jurisdiction over energy issues, which I'm very focused on, renewable energy issues uh, in particular. Um, also the question of how and, and uh, to what extent we should be regulating um, hydraulic fracturing, which is becoming a more present issue for this uh, for this region, and I have my, my concerns about how fast we're moving in that direction. Uh, we need to make sure that that's done um, safely. Uh, but also this has jurisdiction over health, and so much of the Affordable Care Act, I was on the committee when we, when we passed the Affordable Care Act out of the committee, and my background is in, in health care. That's what I did for 18 years before I uh, came to Congress, so I'm very interested in that issue and how the implementation of the Affordable Care Act will go as we uh, move forward. Um, I, won't, I won't list all of these things, but some of the key efforts that I've been involved with, the VETCOR, um, telework um, enhancement among federal agencies, which has uh, certainly relevance for Montgomery County on education issues, public uh, service loan forgiveness, young people who go into public service jobs, government jobs nonprofit jobs, being able to get forgiveness of the significant student debt that many of them have in terms of uh, federal loans, um, and other items um, on the front and back of this. The one I will mention in particular is this Grassroots Democracy Act, which is a piece of legislation I introduced in September and reintroduced about uh, two weeks ago, which is to try to promote uh, grassroots funded citizen owned campaigns, you know, some sort of alternative to the current way most members of Congress have to raise money, which is that they have to go to uh, large moneyed special interests out there. And the effect of that on Congress is that there's an increasing dependency on that funding uh, for campaign uh, dollars. And no surprise, when it comes time to make public policy, the institution tends to then lean in the direction of those interests and oftentimes away from the public interest. 
There is no alternative right now if members of Congress want to try to do things a different way. The Grassroots Democracy Act would propose an alternative. And the other thing I've left for you is the Sarbanes standard. This is just an example of how we communicate with our constituents on a regular basis. This was an issue that we put out after the fiscal cliff was passed. And then behind that, I have a, a little summary of the Grassroots Democracy Act for those of you um, who are interested in it. So that's kind of the view from where I am. But I must say, um, I've already talked longer than I, I wanted to because I want to hear from the council um, the issues that you're um, concerned about. And, you know, I'm very much in a learning mode right now, uh, newly arrived in the county, uh, wanting to understand um, uh, what your perspective is. So let me throw it back to you. And thanks again for the invitation. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Councilor Merlin. Welcome. Uh, this, uh, thanks. The last couple of years, we've been really fortunate to have so many meetings with our congressional delegation. I'm not sure which presiding officer, uh, you know, led the way on that, but it, um, I've been here for a while and we didn't do it quite as often. It's really a tremendous opportunity and uh, really enjoyed getting to know you over the last couple of years. You've been very present in Montgomery County. Um, so, I, so I'm going to touch on just a couple things quickly. First of all, you know, you ask what's of most concern here, and I can't think of anything at the federal level that's of greater concern to our constituents than WMATA. And, um, you know, long, long tradition of Sarbanes is, you know, championing WMATA, and we're just, you know, it's just hurting. I mean, the, the, it's, it's, it's you know, crumbling before our eyes, and um, obviously the agency has put forward this um, very ambitious plan without any real clue of how it's going to be funded. Uh, most of our gripes about failure to step up to the transportation challenge focus on Annapolis because we're counting on the state to do so much for us, but, um, you know, Clearly, for the Maryland delegation, it's got to it's got to be transit priority number one. We want to expand. We want to build a purple line. We want to do other things. But um, Wilmot is facing such hard times. So that's my first point. The second point, and then I'll yield. Um, increasingly, as our constituents hear about the worry about the sequester, I get asked, why would the defense budget be treated? in the same manner as it was when we had two hot wars going on? Is it not obvious on its face that the end of one war and the near-term drawing down of a second ought to change our defense spending priorities? So it's a question I'm relaying from my constituents, but I hear it more and more. It seems evident on its face. Obviously, defense industry is very important to Maryland, but seriously, we were fighting two wars, and soon we won't be anymore. Doesn't right. that change our thinking right. about defense spending? Well, those are both good questions. Let me start with the last one because um, it's a reasonable observation that as we're drawing down these overseas commitments, that ought to free up uh, more resources and allow us to kind of consolidate the defense budget in some ways. Um, keep in mind, though, that the expectation of, of bringing those, of drawing those down in many of the budget mo models and assumptions has already kind of been worked in um, to the discussion. So if you talk to, um, you know, the Department of Defense, if you talk to the administration, um, and if you talk to members of Congress who are focused on the budget, like Chris uh, Van Hollen, obviously, and um, Paul Ryan in the, in the majority uh, in the House, um, they would say that they're already building 10-year models that, that have that included in it. Now, having said that, um, we did kind of break through a psychological wall um, with the defense establishment um, as a result of the debt ceiling debate and sequestration, which is, I think for the first time, you had um, the Department of Defense and other defense-related agencies and then all of the spin-off industries that are associated with them thinking seriously about how do we sort of constrain um, our spending here because the, the writing was was on the wall in a way that it had never been before so you're getting discussions about you know which weapon programs really should be continued which are obsolete I think um, you're getting people to to look more seriously at the question of have some of these expenditures continued just based on sort of political influence more than sound judgment about the merits of a particular uh, weapon system. So it kind of, 
it had a disruptive effect that um, if we can now get to a more serious conversation about how you apply these cuts, could end, we could look back and say, well, that, that was constructive to some degree. My own view is that um, this notion that we have to have one dollar on the domestic side for one dollar on the defense side that's sort of, sort of being chained to that perspective doesn't make a whole lot of sense. We ought to evaluate um, domestic programs for the positive impact that they can have and the investment that they represent for the society here at home. Um, and if it makes sense to um, minimize some of the cuts there versus some of the things we do on the defense side, then that's the, the approach that we, that we ought to take. In terms of investing in our domestic priorities, uh, there's no priority that, that's higher um, than infrastructure. And of course, the president, I give him credit, at a critical time um, when the economy was really in tough shape and when, his, when peer nations around the world were going into a policy of extreme austerity, which they paid for dearly. You look at Great Britain, um, you look at the, the unemployment rate in the Eurozone, which is 11 percent, and climbing. Our president made the decision to invest. Um, because of pushback, I don't think the investment was as great as even he would have liked to see, but it was enough um, to keep the economy going. And so our unemployment rate, while it's unacceptably high for everybody still at 7.8%, um, is so much lower than what we're seeing in other parts of the world where they went into this, this kind of impulse of austerity. Part of that investment was infrastructure, but going forward there has to be more investment in infrastructure. And it makes perfect sense because it needs to be done when you look at the crumbling state of infrastructure, whether you're talking about transit projects or you're talking about schools, et cetera. But the other is it creates a lot of jobs. I mean, it's not like, you know, we have a situation where um, we need to create jobs, we have a pristine uh, infrastructure. <laughs> Um, or we have a crumbling infrastructure, but we have full unemployment. I mean, these things go together. We have a crumbling infrastructure, we ought to invest in it, and we can create jobs from it. And it's right for um, state and local officials and jurisdictions to have that expectation. Now, I've supported strongly the idea of, of um, creating an infrastructure, a national infrastructure bank, <coughs> to help leverage these investments and build those partnerships um, at the state and local level. And I'll keep pushing for that. I think the Democrats are going to do that, and the administration regards that as a real priority. Yeah. Hey, I've got a member of Yes, hi. Hi. Uh, thanks very much for coming over. Um, it's uh, really important to uh, to talk, and uh, we've been, as George said, we've had uh, great conversations with our congressional representatives over the years, and great to have you as part yeah. of the pattern. Um, I'm glad to hear you talk about infrastructure because one of the frustrating things from our perspective, I think we would all collectively agree, is the unreliability and unpredictability of federal uh, infrastructure investment, uh, particularly transportation funding. And we've seen the Surface Transportation Act, you know, been fiddled with a bit over the years, but really no major improvements have been uh, agreed to, and I suppose it's, you know, there, it's bearing the brunt, I think, of a uh, of, of balancing act. Uh, but I do think, I would hope that you'd uh, pay some special attention to that. And, and the other thing I would say, which is something I've certainly said to Chris, um, you guys have just got to resolve this fiscal situation. It's having huge imp local impacts, and I know you know that, with respect to leasing, with respect to federal contractors, with respect to the predictability of federal employment and uh, the related businesses that compri comprise really our base here in Montgomery County and in the, you know, the wa Washington metropolitan region. And uh, we made it through the recession on the scale of things really pretty well, but we are facing this unending now series of indecisions. And I think it's very problematic. And you know, you know what the word on the street is. Congress can't make a decision on this stuff. And I, I would urge you um, to, I hope people are talking about that. I, this council 
in the past few years has made a series of very difficult decisions that have affected employees, that have affected unions, that have affected school funding, uh, transportation, all the things that we personally hold very dear. Mm -hmm. But we did it, and we moved on, and we explained <coughs> it, and people got it. And I do think that what um, the community is looking for is leadership on these points and action. Because as long as this continues, um, and I don't know if you can get away from all the political parlaying that's going on, uh, but as long as there is inaction, it, it's really affecting us, I think, as a community at large. Um, the trust in political leadership, the ability to make decisions, and the ability to make hard ones. I do think that the community understands that you face very difficult decisions. But inaction has as many consequences as action, and I, I, I would urge you, uh, I hope you all can can work this out because kicking, the, continuing to to move the goalposts, I don't think is helping anyone, uh, and I, I think it's very problematic, certainly locally here, in terms of what people, what in, what residents can reasonably expect their future to look like. Uh, so many of our people are associated with the with the federal agencies. So many uh, uh, contracts are out there or not. There's a natural pullback at, age, at federal agency level right now, and uncertainty as to, you know, whether they can make the next payment, and we're certainly seeing that anecdotally. So well, I, I would, you know, I, I know that you all know this, yeah. but I just wanted to uh, reemphasize that because we, it, it, it's, it has the potential to have a major impact on our budget. It's starting to already. The tragic irony of the fiscal situation is that we're. You know, uh, I made the comparative analysis a moment ago, but relative to a lot of our peers, we're, mm -hmm. we're, we're in pretty decent shape if we can just deal with this uncertainty issue that you're talking about. And, you know, you have corporations that, that um, have all this cash which they won't deploy, they're not investing, and you have a consumer, um, you know, you have consumers who aren't consuming because they're uncertain. The, the combined effect mm -hmm. of this, this um, situation of limbo, the state of limbo we're in, is to be cutting off what could be a really terrific economic recovery. We could just get some certainty in place. Um, now, you know, what the public doesn't want to hear about is Who's to blame for it? They're just like, you know, get on and figure it out and work together. Um, and but I do have to say that we contended, it's particularly in the House of Representatives, we contended with some elements in the last two years that seemed more interested in making um, political points than actually governing. In fact, some of them would have said to you very openly that that uh, they don't really believe in government. Well, if that's your starting point, it's very hard to have a, a constructive conversation. Um, the other thing that, that gets back to this issue of money and politics is, you know, there's one, there's one study that shows the average member of Congress now is spending 30 to 70 percent of their time fundraising. So in some ways, your professional fundraisers first and legislators second. The consequences, the casualties of that are really well, dealing with yeah. the material, sure. but also building relationships of trust with your colleagues. Yeah. Um, it, we're living in a different era in <coughs> terms of the relationships that exist. And everyone kind of sort of stays in their corner. The press um, oftentimes, you know, some is responsible, some is not, but the, the, the high scrutiny of it kind of keeps people in their corners. And so, you know, you lock people in rooms and ask them to come up with deals like they did with the, the debt crisis last year, but if the relationships of trust don't exist there, it's very hard to do that. Um, that's an explanation, not an excuse, because the, the public doesn't want to hear excuses, but you're very right, we've got to get some certainty on these fiscal questions. And then I think it will really unleash a recovery that um, will be tremendous for the country. Uh, Belief Council Member Berliner, you are next. Congressman, we haven't spent a lot of time together. I just want to say we, uh, <clears throat> I commend you for your introduction.
to us as a council and just about the way you go about your business. Thank you. It's good to be here. It's very refreshing. I was one of the few that <coughs> thought three was better than two representing our county, uh, and I think you are proving that here today, that, that we have three congressional figures that look after our county is, by definition, better. <coughs> I had the privilege, I'll just speak briefly, uh, of serving with your father when I was legislative director to Howard Metzenbaum in the Senate, and I couldn't agree with you more as to just how the tone of politics has changed so dramatically, even in those times when Howard Metzenbaum, the most populist liberal Democrat that there ever was, if you will, was able to get along with Cliff Hansen from Wyoming and, and good Republican, thoughtful Republicans who would actually sit down and be thoughtful together and play tennis together and have relationships together and how important that was for the working of the Senate and it just doesn't The happen. Serve America Act which I got the vet court to be included in three years ago, was co-sponsored, co-authored by Arne Hatch and Ted Kennedy. Yes. As far apart on the ideological spectrum as you can be. Yes. But they had developed a friendship over the years that allowed them to broker good, sound public policy, which they did in, in many instances. That kind of thing is, is really becoming a relic, unfortunately. It it's just it's so sad. <clears throat> I also had the privilege of serving uh, Henry Waxman as a senior advisor on the committee, and you are, in my judgment, on the best committee. At one point, it was thought that 60% of the bills going through the House went through the Energy and Commerce Committee. Yeah, very so active committee. It is an extraordinary opportunity. <clears throat> Thank you for your work on telecommuting. I hope our county actually does a little better in that way. We need to do better, and appreciate your leadership. When you talk about infrastructure, and my colleagues <clears throat> have correctly pointed out transportation, your introduction to this part of the world introduces you to PEPCO. Um, one of the issues that we are dealing with in utilities generally, which I think you can appreciate, is the need to make a huge leap forward in our electric distribution system. I don't know if you saw Tom Friedman's article in the New York Times talking about Chattanooga and the need to make just a giant leap forward. <clears throat> Many of us are calling it Utility 2.0. Mm -hmm. The governor has embraced that. Montgomery County may be the first pilot in the nation Terrific. with respect to that. And I'd be happy at some point to meet with you and your staff to talk about that and the support you could give with respect to it. Because you talk about the nature of infrastructure improvements that would make such a material difference in our day-to-day -day lives. This is one of them. No so question. I'd, I'd love to do that. I appreciate it. Cancel my well, thank you for, for being here. Sure. Congratulations, and, and thank you especially for the leadership on the uh, the Grassroots Democracy Act. Uh, My pleasure. I think yeah. your comments were really insightful about how campaign financing, the changes in it, have changed Congress. Uh, and people aren't spending time together. They're fundraising. They're raising money increasingly in large contributions uh, from interest groups, and this would give people incentives to seek small individual contributions, to not take PAC money, uh, and to have access to public funds if a huge amount of money is being spent right. in the race. So uh, that's all really important, especially since the Supreme Court has decimated uh, campaign finance law with the uh, Citizens for United decision. So as someone who used to be the executive director of Common Cause of Maryland, it's really close right. to my heart. And, and, uh, Common Cause is one of our uh, supporters on this bill. They've done some terrific work in this area. They have, and, uh, and thank you for you know, your leadership on it. On the issue of sequest uh, sequestration, uh, about a year and a half ago, Moody's downgraded, or at least they, they put us on a negative watch. They put Montgomery County on a negative watch because of what was going on in Congress and a few other states as well that receive a fair amount of federal funding. Uh, and so when Congress uh, sneezes, we get a cold. Uh, and so what is your expectation about what will happen with sequestration? Well. Um my expectation is that the uh, Republican majority in the House views, they made a political decision not to try to uh, extract cuts in the budget and, for example, go, go to what I call the earned benefit programs. Others call those entitlement programs. I call them earned benefit programs. They made the, the, the judgment that politically it was not smart for them to link um, the uh, the debt ceiling discussion to the to the sequestration discussion. So they they pushed off the debt ceiling. 
Um, but they're now going to use sequestration as kind of the leverage to go try to get substantial <coughs> cuts. And of course, the fiscal cliff discussion that we had at the end of the year basically left the entitlement programs untouched. Um, but it didn't mean that the specter of that wasn't coming back, and I think it will come back in the context of, of sequestration. So um, you're going to get you're going to get a, a debate that's really pitting. Unfortunately, um, will be pitting you know Head Start against Medicare, for example, the young against uh, our seniors. Um, but they are determined to force that issue, and I think what what the president and what Democrats are going to try to do um, is insist on a values-based discussion around that. Um, and, you know, I don't think it means that, that either the administration or Democrats are going to um, close their ears to, to all proposals on how you can find savings. That wouldn't help what you're talking about if we did. <laughs> But um, I think we're going to try and insist on that being a conversation that's, that's fact-based rather than opinion-based. A lot of what we struggle with is um, the, the extent to which so many members of Congress um, take positions that don't appear to be uh, connected to the facts and the evidence. Um, and it makes it very difficult sometimes to have a discussion, if you, you, you know, you know, the, the saying is, you know, you, you're entitled to your your own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own set of facts, and we struggled with that. So it's going to be very contentious, and we will start. I, I expect start hearing pretty soon what the opening um, position is going to be from the the House uh, Republican uh, majority on this. Um, what's going to be critical? in this is, is having the country support the President and the Democrats on this issue of it being a balanced response. In other words, we're not going to solve the sequestration problem exclusively through cuts. There's got to be revenue. Now, some of that will be um, in the tax expenditure realm, but there's got to be a revenue part to the discussion. and. In the fiscal cliff discussion, we, we sort of s began to set the precedent for that. And um, I understand that, that when, when Washington sneezes, you and others get a cold, but particularly uh, counties that are as dependent upon um, the federal agencies, as I said, either directly or indirectly, it has implications. And as you mentioned, um, and as I said at the outset, it has implications for your for your bond rating, which then increase, I mean, you know, you go, you go down just a notch and it increases right. your costs across uh, the board in what is really an unfair way when you think about it. Um, and, you know, this is a well-managed jurisdiction. Um, County Executive uh, Leggett is, uh, stands in a tradition of people who um, make tough decisions and work with the council to make tough, tough decisions. Um, and so I can understand why you look at Congress sometimes sideways when you're struggling to do the right thing uh, here. So that's what I expect will happen as this rolls out. Thank you. Council Bradley. Thank you for coming. And yeah. I appreciate the fact that you reached out really early. And you and I had conversations as soon as it looked like you were inheriting the territory. And uh, I, was, I really appreciated your mm -hmm. outreach on that. Um, I'm, I'm like everybody else interested in what can be done for transit and, and also recognize that the state has to play a larger role than, um, than the feds are going to pay in our solutions. Uh, I was interested in uh, your comments uh, about public finance and I was hoping you could maybe tap some of our friends in the House of Delegates and the State Senate on the shoulder and suggest that the proposal in front of them to increase the campaign contribution <coughs> something not needed if you, if you want to do anything to further destroy democracy, increase the amount of money that the wealthy can give to campaigns, and suggest that maybe this is a little bit out of touch with where people are trying to go to make these processes. <coughs> um, well, of course, the, the problem with that, the proposal in, in, the, in the 
legislature is a tricky one because, you know, one could argue that if you really close some of these LLC loopholes and other things, which allow what is really just one interest to divide themselves up in a way that they can distribute them. That if those were really closed, then an argument that the overall limit should go up has a little more merit to it. But if you can't be assured the one is going to happen, then certainly there's danger in doing, um, in doing the other. And I'm glad you pointed to that because this I'm about to go to North Carolina to talk to some folks about their efforts in their state to combat the influence of of big money and how it distorts public policy. But this is happening at all levels and it's happening in ways that's unseen largely um, because we don't have, I mean, you know, Chris Van Hollen has been a champion on disclosure and transparency, which is part of the solution to this. Um, the other is pushing back on the Citizens United case and the public have expressed outrage about that and are pushing for a constitutional amendment, which is very hard to do. Those are two measures designed to constrain sort of the bad actors in the system. Public funding and grassroots, a sort of grassroots <coughs> public funding hybrid as a way to fund congressional campaigns for starters um, is about empowering the good actors out there, which are ordinary citizens who want their government to respond to them. And you know, what I always say to people at the end of these talks is somebody's going to own your government, right? It's either going to be special interests who have a lot of money and are underwriting campaigns, in which case when it comes time to make public policy, that's the direction the institutions will lean in, or it will be ordinary citizens. And, you know, the kind of proposal we put forward is a way to, to give it back to ordinary citizens. I think it's, a, it's important work to be done. I know your comments on fracking. I'm, I'm wondering whether um, your committee uh, could actually um, use the uh, National Academy of Sciences to actually do a fracking study. Um, they've been called on you know, to do some work, right. I think, for the state of Virginia. And I don't know where Maryland's going to go with this. But you know, you have this resource at Congress's disposal. They're probably the least expensive yeah. research papers you'll ever get. Well, we're going we're to look in. at that. Um, now, in the minority, we don't have as much um, juice in terms of what we can make happen. Um, in commissioning these things, but that's certainly a reasonable um, request, uh, you know, because of the uh, Dick Cheney Halliburton um, uh, loophole. Um, we don't have as much oversight uh, and jurisdiction at the federal level over over hydraulic fracturing um, as we could and should. And I'm a I'm a co-sponsor of Diane DeGette's bill that would close that loophole and restore the jurisdiction. Um, to the EPA to, to really kind of police what's happening there. My perspective on hydraulic fracturing, and look, I understand it's the bridge that gets us from the dirtiest fossil fuels to a renewable future, um, and that in terms of the impact on climate change, it's less than what we have with sort of, you know, coal-fired electrical sources and so forth. But, um, we could easily easily get trapped into thinking that this is going to be our energy source for you know the foreseeable future and not keep moving towards the renewable um, energy sources and my perspective is based on the chesapeake bay watershed because the watershed is you know it starts up there in cooperstown new york right um, so you got new york pennsylvania maryland virginia west virginia um, Delaware and the District of Columbia. And then you look at the footprint of the Marcellus Shale deposit, and it's New York, Pennsylvania, Virginia, West Virginia, Maryland. So they're practically, you know, the, 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 the shale deposit and the watershed basically occupy the same footprint. And I'm worried about the cumulative impact on the bays, um, fortunes going forward of unrestrained hydraulic fracturing that isn't taking a, a sort of larger regional perspective, which of course is exactly the thing that the federal government can offer you if they have good oversight and it really can't be captured on a state-by-state -state basis. So this is something that offers a lot of promise for the country. Um, it, it's, it's fast leading us towards energy independence, according to all of the statistics. 
Um, but if it's that much of an opportunity, we can afford to do it safely, and there's many different things that you have to look at in that regard. So, so my last question is, what if sequestration is the best deal, or it's the best tool to get a discussion of revenues, revenues on the table? I've read a bunch of stuff where the suggestion is if you open up the deal, the Republicans are simply going to want to minimize the cuts on defense, which maximizes even more cuts on the domestic side. And just saying, we're not this, you know, we're not going to discuss anything unless there's a revenue increase, and then the revenues can go to mitigate defense and domestic spending to some extent. That might be better than opening the whole thing up and winding up with less domestic spending. Well, that's all going to be part of the <laughs> analysis that the president and the Democrats and Congress um, and the Republicans, for that matter, are going to do as we get um, as we get closer uh, to it. Uh, there's, you know, there's no question that the idea of sequestration is to gore everyone's ox, and that as you get closer, closer to the the effects of that, people will, you know, that'll be what brings them to the table in a serious way. Um, again, we had elements in the last go round on that debt ceiling discussion that didn't view shutting down government or you know closing it up or shrinking it to, to drown it in the bathtub as um, goring their ox they didn't care they didn't care and um, you know it's like they were holding the, the, the government and as a result of the country by the ankles off, the, off, off of the edge of the building and saying you know we'll let go and that's what the president was dealing with in those negotiations at the end I think we have less of that this time. We've gotten through an election. The president was reelected, um, you know, by a by a impressive margin, all things considered. And this this notion of designing all of your policy, as Mitch McConnell seemed to do, around the, the goal of defeating the president, that's now behind us. And I'm hoping that you know, in this two-year period. Um, we can get many things done, but certainly in a much shorter period for purposes of certainty. Um, they'll come to the table in a more serious way, and we can get something brokered. Council Vice President. Well, Congressman, I'll see you very quick. I want to thank you very much, uh, but wanted to bring up two quick points, and one of them is uh, regarding solar energy. I've heard a lot of discussion about new and innovative ways in which we can continue uh, to put forth uh, wind energy. And it seems as though the federal government uh, it seems to strike on the newest, hottest thing while forgetting about some of the tried and trues that have been around for a long time. When you look at Germany and other countries that have done a great job uh, with fostering solar energy and uh, really making that work, uh, what we see here throughout the state but also throughout the region is that um, there are very few people that do it, and those people that do it see the great returns. But Beyond that, there's no, really not a lot of federal incentives beyond, I mean, I know the program that exists, but it's still not enough to really motivate your average homeowner uh, to be able to utilize the systems. And so wanted to see if there was any movement on that part. But as part of the greater discussion, when we talk about uh, what truly has the largest impact, uh, we always relate everything to cars. You know, when we talk about solar panels, a solar panel equals, you know, two and a half uh, cars worth uh, emissions for an entire year. So if our real crux in really getting a handle on, on our environment and on greenhouse gas emissions and really affecting climate change is cars, then our focus should be on mass transit and supporting transportation. And so when you hear from us talking about mass transit, I mean, I've just been very disappointed with the fact that you hear that the colleagues around the table have said that we're really relying upon the state and there is no longer a conversation about the federal government truly being a partner with us. And so because you're on energy, because you understand the challenges that we face, I hope that there will be a resurgence for us to continue the conversation about what it truly means to have uh, functional mass transit systems in some of our most populous areas to where people drive uh, and need to get those people out of cars, build uh, mass transit systems like the Quarter City Transit Way and the Purple Line, uh, the Baltimore uh, uh, Red Line, all of those things need to happen, and it shouldn't be a conversation about, well, we can't afford it. Uh, it should be about how do we accomplish this so that we can get to that uh, end goal, which is, you know, really having a true effect on climate change. So. Well, I appreciate those comments. I mean, 
you know, fundamentally, let's be candid, it's an embarrassment for a country like the United States to have an infrastructure situation like we do. And, you know, there's, there's many bases upon which our, um, our peers around the world look to the United States for leadership. But one of them, I think, um, is that we're sort of setting the standard on how you invest in and make strong your own society. And, and I think some of the anxieties that used to be expressed based on sort of, you know, the sort of cowboy attitude with which we, we, we walk the, the international stage and so forth have been replaced by anxieties when they look at the limited investment we're making in our own infrastructure. And they ask themselves, how can the United States continue to be a strong leader and partner with us on the international stage when its own internal infrastructure is as fragile as it appears to be? And you look at the investments that are made in other places, um, by fiat in places like you know, China, but by democratic um, you know, consensus in places like Germany and Europe and, when it comes to infrastructure, and then you look what we're doing, and it is an embarrassment. It's nothing short of it. Um, the president in his inaugural the other day, um, I thought it was striking. He acknowledged the fiscal challenges we face, and he's clearly committed to resolving them. But he didn't dwell a lot on the deficit. He talked about the important investments that the country has to make. And that goes to the infrastructure, and also goes to recognition that the best way to to make your economy strong and restore a sound fiscal position um, is to get things moving and to invest. Um, and as I say, I think he demonstrated that with the, the stimulus um, program, as much of a hit as that took sort of out in the, in, in the public, uh, but it made a difference to our country. And those sorts of investments going forward are going to be uh, critical. In terms of, of renewable energy sources, you're absolutely right. I mean, they got backyard solar and wind capacity in places like Germany that puts us to shame. They've somehow figured out how to do this. By the way, they also know how to do advanced manufacturing in ways that we are still not um, grasping in this country. And I think we need to have a national policy on, on manufacturing um, as, we, um, as we move forward. But um, tax credits are part of the solution, and in the fiscal cliff deal, we did extend a lot of these renewable energy tax credits. But frankly, until you put a price on carbon somehow, somehow, um, and get that what is, what is a huge externality in economic terms, folded into the economic model that make people, that upon which people base their decisions on how to invest. Could be a great way to balance the budget. You're, well, there you go. You're not going to make the progress that we need to make. So that, certainly in my committee assignment, that will be a topic that I, that I dwell on. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Congressman. I, I thank you all. particularly appreciate, you know, listening to your global perspective because it is very relevant. Um, I also want to say that I'm very pleased to see your outreach um, a strategy here, and I know that you have an extraordinary assistant that was I do trained very do well. <laughs> Someone you all know, Alexis Reed. <laughs> trained Nancy trained for a very of years. well in outreach, so I can guarantee you it's going to be extraordinary. Alexis will be staffing our Burtonsville office That's and doing That's wonderful. And, um, and in closing, I will just say that it was described here as some of the tough decisions that we made very much, uh, very true, but we did it in a balanced way. I mean, we're continually looking at how we invest in our social infrastructure, you know, as well as our economic infrastructure. And uh, and as you do your outreach, you're going to find that in this particular area, there are a lot of needs. Yeah. And uh, so it is, I think, very important for you to take that to the national scene. And when you are making those decisions or educating your colleagues, um, really, truly be able to relay uh, some of the challenges that you know you find in your own backyard and some of the potential that exists. I also so. want to introduce Bridget Smith, who directs my outreach uh, uh, for the office. Wonderful. Thank you all thank very you much. Thank you so much. Appreciate thank it. You. Did you get some food? Yeah.